<laughs> so good morning. So I'd like to welcome uh, Margaret Dean, uh, better known as Peggy Dean, from the Bar Manhattan Community College, BMCC. Uh, Peggy was a student here at the Graduate Center a couple of years ago under Gilbert Bonslag. And uh, today she is going to speak uh, about Methabelian product of a free neoporting group with a free abelian uh, group. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I'd like to thank the speakers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, let me see if I can work this. Yes. All right. So first of all, uh, I'm going to be talking about residual torsion-free nilpotence of certain groups. Which, why should I talk about them? Residual, residual torsion-free nilpotence has a few very nice properties. If your group, let me stop saying it, is, is RTFN, then uh, first of all, the conjugacy problem can be solved, explicitly solved, not just, you know, we know it, it, it can be solved. If G is finitely generated, it's also a residually finite P group. And, if, and it's also finitely generated, it's Hopfian. I'm sure there's a hundred other nice qualities. Uh, so we know. Uh, Residual torsion-free nilpotence. If you go to the free product of two residually torsion-free nilpotent groups, that's been proved to be again residually torsion-free nilpotent. Maltsev did that, I think. Uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. three hundred years or so. <laughs> Are you sure three hundred? Well, maybe I'm off by a little bit. I'll edit that out. <laughs> so. Uh, the question that is now has been posed is to bring it down to metabelian, the metabelian variety. What can we say about free metabelian products of residually torsion-free nilpotent metabelian groups? We toss in the word metabelian. Uh, are, are they residually torsion-free nilpotent metabelian? Let me just give you a few definitions of, of what I'm talking about here. So metabelian groups. What are metabelian groups? Um, I guess the easiest thing to say is that, it, so there's a, a verbal subgroup that defines the variety, and it's the second derived group. You know, so essentially what you can say is that uh, in, a met, in any metabelian group, the commutators commute. In a free metabelian group, that would be the single, I can't say the single relator, but the single uh, uh, definition that defines the free metabelian group. And one consequence of that, which you know, which was important in, in the proofs that I'm going to show you, is that that means that every commutator is is a left normed commutator, which means uh, you know, there's there's no commutators within the entries of a commutator. Hmm. Yeah, just... Can can you define a right right normed commutator? Well, I mean, does that even exist? I don't think so. No. Hmm. It does. It is simply it an ordering choice uh -huh. whether you want to, uh, if you can also change your conjugation uh -huh. accordingly. Right. Mm -hmm. Strange things happen when you change well, your conjugation. Yes. Right? yes. <laughs> you can lose a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. you know? So you're saying if you have a commutator here and then a word here. Yes. Yeah. So you go from right to uh, left. Because you can because you. Because uh, the elementary tricks of group theory, where you always insert and take out, put in a pinch, as Anthony likes to say. Okay. Yeah. I don't know about that. So, uh, and I'm going to be using this little notation, fancy a squared, anytime I want to represent a variety of metabelian groups, so I don't have to keep saying commutators commute. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we define the free metabelian product? It's going to be like a free product, but we need to make sure we end up in a metabelian uh, group. So you take two metabelian groups, you take their free product, and uh, sorry, over here, you take their free product, and then you factor out by the second derived group. Mm -hmm. Guarantees it's metabelian uh, and doesn't toss in anything extra. And Hannah Neumann came up with that idea. Also, Can you want to read back for one second? Yeah. So you take your two, your, your groups are already metabelian. Oh, okay. You take the free product, mm -hmm. 
factor out by the second derived group of that free product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which really is going to consist of a uh, commutator subgroup of A1 with A2, because mm -hmm. everything else is already gone. Yeah. So it's, it's certainly not free metabolism, but it is metabolism. It depends on A1 yeah. and A2. If A1 and A2 are free metabolism. If they were free metabolism, then they yeah. would mm -hmm. mm -hmm. be free metabolism. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's like free products. Right, right. All right, so I'm talking about residual nilpotence. <coughs> Let me just remind you what, what residual means. So if you have some property of groups, that you can't, it's got to be a property that yeah. is isomorphism invariant, inherited by subgroups. It's got to be like nilpotency. You can't say a group, uh, let's see, you know, like what can't you say? You can't say a group has a center with a finite index, or, you know, like that. That's not inherited by, by subgroups, necessarily. But uh, if you have a group satisfying P, you call it a P group, so a nilpotent group, a finite group. A P group. Has a P, a a, not a P group, like a P group, but a <laughs> fancy P group. And then if you take another group G, then that would be residually P <coughs> if for any word, non-trivial word that you take in G, if you can map it somehow, somewhere, to, uh, to a P group, which takes your word non-trivially to that P group. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I'm going to later talk about fully residually mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Free. Whatever. Where's the next say. talk? What? You say you're giving a, a next talk? No, no. Later on in this later talk. Here. Oh, oh, great. This I very love talk. fully residually. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't put down what fully residually <laughs> free means, but uh, but that's even better. You could take uh -huh. any finite subset of words, and they can be mapped um, distinctly and non-trivially mm -hmm. to some target group, which mm -hmm. satisfies the property you're talking about. Just a little history. Uh, uh, I think it was, maybe it was re, anyhow. It, it was proved that if you took a, a free metabolian group just by itself, that is residually torsion free no potent. And then uh, there came several proofs from several people, Bamslog, uh, re, Bamslog, Levin, mostly working, in, it became a byproduct of other theorems that they were talking, that they were working on, but uh, a free metabolian product of a free abelian group or even a torsion free abelian group is going to be residually torsion free no potent. So you start with two free abelian groups, you form that free metabelian product. Abelian groups, of course, are metabelian. Their second derived group equals one. Mm -hmm. uh, and the result is residually torsion free no potent. But that's sort of at the bottom level. It would be great. It would be great to have a theorem that says, you know, yes, all uh, all residually torsion free nilpotent metabelian groups take their free product. You still get it. Mm -hmm. But we're sort of working from the bottom up, and, and this was, I guess, the bottom. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is notching it up one step. That if you took the free metabelian product of uh, a free nilpotent group, class two with a free abelian group, that will be residually torsion free no potent. So I'm going to keep an abelian group on, on one side, but I'll take a free no potent group, class two. Mm -hmm. Any number of generators on either side. I guess the next step would be three no potent, but not today. Okay. Or change the free abelian. Or change the free abelian to so two nil potents, yeah. Or just somebody's going to come along right, and prove the whole thing. One more point is enough. So what was it? Sorry, what was it? Free, 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 all right, so I need a, uh, I used a bunch of lemmas in proving this theorem. And the first one, there comes a moment when I need to say, aha, this is a nilpotent group. And so this, this lemma is, is uh, what allows me to do so. You, you know, you have a group G, you have a normal subgroup, and you make the quotient. And then if it turns out, um, if, if there's an increasing central series that terminates in N, so if N itself is, is uh, nilpotent, 
And if there's an action of Q on N that acts trivially on the terms of the central sequence, in other words, if, if, you, uh, if we have our M1, N2, N3 going up inside N, and if you took N3 over N2, uh, you would take that sequence, N, N M over N, M minus 1, those are all abelian. Um, and so Q acts trivially on those quotients. And finally, if Q is nilpotent, then G is nilpotent. When you look at it, when you think about it, it's, it's, it seems like obvious, although so many things seem obvious to me. That <laughs> it's, it's, no, in fact, I've proved many things that seemed obvious to me that I then realized, no. <laughs> but anyway, uh, OK. So if you could just collect that data, you can say, all right, so G is no potent. Now there's certain, um, I'm using commutators all over the place in, in, in this proof. In this proving this theorem, every possible commutator you can ever think of from, from Hall, anything you could invent yourself, I probably used it. Uh, <laughs> I proved a few commutator identities only to find out. Actually, here, uh, the, next, the next two, I proved them only to find out. Everybody knows that. <laughs> so, anyway, so this is the uh, Jacobi identity for metabelian groups. It, it, it actually comes from a, a more general Jacobi identity that says if you take these three commutators, x, y, z, and then rotate it around and take a product, you get one. Very nice. Uh, if you have a metabelian group, and if you have a commutator of this sort, x, y, z, w, as long as you hold the x, y constant, you can switch the, the rest of the stuff around any way you like, and it's all going to be equal. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, uh, extends, you don't have to have just four entries, you can have 300 entries. Keep x, y, but keep the first two entries fixed, rearrange however you want and all the others, and uh, it, they're still equal. It doesn't work with three. Well, what's to rearrange? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could rearrange the Z. Z in place. Of course, Z. by default, it works. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So what happens if you do rearrange X and Y? If you switch X and Y, uh, you get the inverse. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile with, the, meanwhile, with the rest of them, do what you like. Rearrange them any way you like. Because the only thing you can't do is move X or Y back beyond the, uh, the first two positions. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to prove a modified theorem. I'm going to prove this lemma. Never mind about a 2 nil potent group of arbitrary rank. Let me take a 2 nil potent group of rank 2, so two generators, and a free abelian group of rank 1, an infinite cyclic group, and let me prove the theorem for that. And that will be the key. That's going to be the key. That's where yeah. all the work is. After I've proved that, I'm then going to show that, that the true product that I want is residually a, uh, a, a nil po two nil potent group on two generators, the free abelian product of a two nil potent group on so two generators with an abelian cyclic group. Sorry. So, and, and, and QED. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to give you the idea of the proof. I'll try to skip over all the commutator calculations. I will skip over all the commutator calculations. But uh, start with N, your, your typical nilpotent, free nilpotent group on two generators. You see three generators there because I want to identify the commutator, Yx, and calling it Z. So X and Y are, are the generators. Meanwhile, A, infinite cyclic on little a. So my three generator group is, uh, is X, Y, and A. P is now that free metabelian product. I take the free product of N with A, factor out by the second derived group. And so here's what the presentation looks like up to the metabelian part. Uh, it's X, Y, Z, A, and again, the Z is not needed, but I'm putting it in there. Z is, is Y, X. Zx, Zy, equal, uh, the commutators are equal to one. Z, Z is central, of course, in N. So the uh, the only difference, uh, uh, if you compare N with P, right? All you need to do is add, add the A to 
the generating set and then and then go to the metavillian array. Right? Yes. Or something like that. Something like that because A, of course, you've taken the free product, so A is like not interacting with anything. Right. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now what I'm going to do is take this fairly straightforward presentation, as Marco said, and just add the A, and I'm going to kind of shuffle it around into some crazy new configuration. So let me start by taking X and A, that can come from different factors of the free product, mm. uh, and form a subgroup M on X and A. That's a free metabelian group of rank two, X with A. There's nothing going on between the two, but, but it is metabelian. Mm -hmm. Uh, of rank two. So what did I leave out? I, I left out Y. I'm not counting Z because Z is uh, not actually a generator. So I'm going to take K to be the normal closure of, of Y in P. And what that works out to mean is that K is the group generated by Y itself, Y with A, and conjugated by, by all kinds of things, a to the i, x to the i. I don't need z to the i because commutators commute, and z is a commutator. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's z. Z is, uh, of course, is, is uh, y conjugated by x, more or less. You know, it comes from y conjugated by x, but then conjugated by a to the l. You know, so if you write all those out, you see that, that covers everything of the normal closure. I, J, and L, any integer. All right, so K is the normal closure of Y in P, and if M takes up everything else, if you mod, if you take P and mod out by K, you get something isomorphic to M. That gives us a short exact sequence. P factored up by K, what's left? X and A are, are, are left. So that gives us M. We get a short exact sequence, and M acts on K by conjugation, which means the sequence splits, which means that we could write P as a semi-direct product of K by M. So I'm slowly transforming P something different than what it is. It's the same thing, but it looks different. So now you start looking at, okay, so how do things work uh, uh, as I look at my semi-direct product? I know that x commutes with z already, but does x commute with z to the a? Mm -hmm. The answer is yeah. Yes, it does. So does y. Furthermore, the z to the a's, a to the l's, uh, they're all in k. And they generate a free abelian group of infinite rank. That's over over Z. All right. So, and I'm gonna better start writing some of this down because we want to keep track of it. So I'm get I get sick of writing Z A to the L. So I'm just gonna call it Z sub L. But but Z sub L. <coughs> is the group generated by x, y, z, a, uh, x, z, y, z equal 1. Am I missing anything? Oh, um, oh z, and z equals x, y, or y, x. So. And that's in the metabolic variety. And that's in the metabolic variety. <coughs> and now we're saying that M is the free metabolian group on X and A. Okay. And K is the normal closure. Let we'll me just go back and copy it. K is the group generated by y, y a to the a i, a to the i, uh, x to the j, and then the z's to the a to the l, and all those things are over z, but I won't put that. 
And so now as I start to transform, I'm going to say Z to the A to the L. I'm just going to call it ZL, Z sub L. Uh, and then there's another free abelian group of infinite rank inside K. It's the, the Y comma A's to the A to the I, X to the J. Turns out that's also free abelian of infinite rank. And again, I'm, I get tired of writing all that, so I'm going to write W, I, comma, J when I really mean Y, A. A to the I, X to the J. And I'm going to start building up some subgroups inside K. So I start with A0, which is the group generated by the WIJs, so a nice free abelian group, infinite rank. And then A sub K is going to be the group generated by this commutator conjugated by Y to the K. So what that turns out to be, well, that is what it is. They're all, everything we're looking at is commutators. Uh, and then I'll take A to be the, the product of all those AKs. And that's over Z. So I've got a whole string of, of, uh, of A's. And the fact that it's a direct, is it, it's a direct product? It's a direct product. Turns out to be, right? Yeah. Well, uh, well mean? the AKs, well, these are all commutators. Commutators commute. No, no, but, but it, is it easy to see that it's direct? Oh, that they're, that the intersections are trivial? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, well, everything that I just said is exactly the description of a wreath product. You have this whole bunch of A's, uh, and the, the Y's conjugate A from one place to another. K conjugated by Y gives A sub K plus 1. And just in case you want a reminder of what a wreath product looks like, uh, this is the standard thing. A wreath T is, is uh, the semi-direct product of some group B with T. Well, what is B? B is this product of conjugates of A by each element of T. And they do have trivial intersection. And they do commute with one another. So here, my A sub 0 is the A, and, uh, and the cyclic group on Y is my T. So we get that we know P is equal to K semi-direct M, but K is going to turn out to be A0 wreath Y crossed with direct product with, with the ZLs, because they're not part of that semi-direct product, semi-direct uh, by M. So, I don't know, should I just track it all? I've got, uh, I've got my WIJs, here they are, my Y comma A's, conjugated by Y. I've got my ZALs as a, as a direct product uh, piece of K. And then, of course, I have the M, which is semi-directing the whole thing. And that's how we're going to look at it to say, aha, we've got a residually torsion-free group here. So we take a word W, not equal to 1, and we're looking now for a target to, uh, to send it to. <coughs> Since P is a semi-direct product, means I can always write W uniquely as a product of M with K, where M is, is uh, in M and K is in K. So the first case is a very easy case. If M itself, the, the metabelian piece, is not equal to 1, just factor out by K, you get M. M we know to be residually torsion-free nil potent, so just send it off to wherever it needs to be sent, uh, and, and the W goes. So now we consider the case, well, what if M itself is equal to 1? What if all there is to W is, is uh, a little word that's, uh, or a big word, that's in K? There's K again. 
So what do we have? It means the W is a product of a whole bunch of things which could include powers of Y, um, a finite number of powers of different WIJs to the YK, and a finite number of powers of different ZLs. So I don't know, W might look like this. Y to the fourth, uh, Y, let's say yeah, WIJ, W12 to the Y times W. 3a times y to the negative 2, and then I'll toss in a z1 to the 4, no, yeah, to the 4th, and z2 to the 7th. Yeah, that might be w. And you can really assume, I mean, the one I had had, had a few negative exponents, but you can assume that all those those uh, I's, J's, K's, and L's are all positive or any have non-negative, um, which just has to do with, you can always conjugate, you know, up and down the line. And if you can prove that a word is non-trivial, then it's conjugate, it's non-trivial as well. So my I's, uh, the I's are the subscript on, the first subscript on the W, I'm going to say they range from, from, um, from, yeah, 0 to n. And the j's are going to go from 0 to p. That's the second subscript on the w's. The k's that are the powers of the y's conjugating the w's run from 0 to q. And the l's, those are the subscripts on the z's. Those are going to run from 0 to m. So the l's are actually the power on the a that's conjugating z. And of course, you have to keep saying, what, what are these things? So, you know, you, you know, there's no test at the end. It's a lot of bookkeeping. It's a lot yeah, of bookkeeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to say that if, if you included some of these letters to be E's and C's, you'd probably spell my last name out of all wow. this. Wow. <laughs> 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 yeah, I have so, so many J's and C's in there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so now I need to cook up a target group. And I'm, I choose L1. It's, it's going to be his brand new. Uh, groups H semi direct T. Mm -hmm. What does the C there? Good. There you go. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. I mean, e now. I don't think I have one. It's like uh, Jeopardy. T is not, not Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Will Fortune. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never mind. T is a free metabelian group on, on generators R and T. I need to toss in some new letters. And H is going to be a group generated by a uh, single letter S. A whole bunch of betas that are triple subscripted, beta ijk, and, and those ijks uh, do not run over z. The i's run from zero to n, just like the just like the i's did before. And the j's run from zero to p. The k's run from zero to q. And then we have a new bunch of generators, c sub l, and the l's run from zero to m. So I'm kind of cooking it up. Um, what else do I need to say? Well, well, so what do all those betas and S's and CL's do with each other? The betas commute with one another. Uh, the C, and, and that means they commute with one another and in H, uh, they're central. Mm -hmm. So they commute with the, excuse me, I'm sorry. The betas commute with one another. If you take the K up to its highest level, beta ijq, that lies in the center. The CLs are in the, in the center, period. The center, not of, uh, not of L1, but the center of H. And S acts on the betas. It acts on the betas by, uh, by well, beta ijk to the S is that same beta ijk times beta ijk plus 1. Now, every time you do a, a conjugation action, you're really, you can, you can rearrange things and you're looking at a commutator. So essentially what I'm doing here, I'm, I don't ask you to work out the math, I'm going to show it to you, but essentially what I'm doing here is making the action of S, it, it, it's creating a longer and longer commutator. Okay. Eventually, it's the K plus one, right? So that eventually, 
the, when the commutators get long enough, they're going to be in the center, mm -hmm. which is the near potency. And they'll probably oh. check it. <laughs> okay, so well. meanwhile, now we remember we had T, that was the free metabelian group. It, it's acting on, on H, so what does it do? S to the T takes S to S beta 0, 0, 0, the starting point of the betas. Uh, beta to the T uh, pops up the first subscript by 1, uh -huh. bumps it up, except the beta T, once you get to the top, then once you get to N, it acts trivially. CL to the, C, to the T gives you CL times CL plus 1. CM to the T, when you get to the top, acts trivially. S to the R starts, starts the C generation, gives you SC0. And beta IJK to the R bumps up the second subscript. Beta, once you get to the top, beta IPK, the top of that second subscript, acts trivially. And CL to the R just acts trivially always, Rx trivially. And so once you rearrange things and, and do all your bookkeeping, you see that all of these betas and the CLs are all commutators in R, S, and T. So, so beta 0, 0, 0 is the commutator S with T. Remember, mm -hmm. S was in K and T is over there in M. Mm -hmm. uh, beta I plus 1 JK is the commutator of beta I, I, J, K, the previous one with T, and so on. You know, each, each higher com each higher beta is a commutator uh, of, of a beta that comes before it. C0 is the commutator SR, and CL plus 1 again is, is a commutator of CL with T, which means our group L1 is generated by just R, S, and T, all the other, all the other generators I show you at first uh, are in fact not needed as generators. So, you know, so now it turns out that H is Q plus 1 nilpotent. And just as I said, if you look at a long enough commutator, it turns out to be in the center. So H is nilpotent. So I'm you know, feeling good about my L1. Uh, I, and I get a non-trivial image. So I, I map you know, my, my W sending, sending the, the generators from P to the obvious and appropriate places, and I get a non-trivial image. So life is good. Almost. Almost, but there's just <laughs> one problem. The problem is, is, uh, is T, that free metabelian group. Well, free metabelian groups are not nilpotent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I gotta, I gotta it. tweak it a little more. I gotta fix that and modify T so that T is nilpotent. <laughs> and that everything else still stays the way it was. I like everything else except T. So now I start with those crazy commutator identities, and I work, and I work, and I work, and I find out that if you go far enough in the lower central series uh, for T, you get, uh, you get the gamma of, you know, way out there, a gamma of T acts trivially on H. And how far out do you have to go? Well, that depends on the M and the N. Uh, so you, you pick new, you know, large enough to make sure that it acts trivially, and it does. And since it acts trivially, then that action of T factors through. T factored out by that gamma. Now we have a nice nilpotent group. So our true L is H semi-directed with T factored out by some gamma of some, some, some far distance out. That's the L I want. Whoops. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, oh, excuse me, but is L nilpotent? Well, here's the moment that I, that I bring out my little lemon and say, well, you know, I satisfied this, I satisfied that, everything's satisfied. Yes, L is nilpotent. And, uh, and, and that W will still go non-trivially non to L. So that's the modified theorem. <laughs> <laughs> so so L, L1 is an important part, right? 
a part of L1 part was of L1. Pump. H was nil pump. H was nil pump. It was just that free metabelian group that was acting on H. But L1 itself uh, is not. not nil pump. So I just fixed the metabelian group with N in such a way that nothing else changes. Mm -hmm. So now I go to, to the real theorem that I want to prove. I take P now to be N, uh, the free metabelian product of N with A, but now N is 2 nil potent of any rank, mm -hmm. and A is free abelian of any rank. And what I want to show is that this P is residually a free metabelian product of the 2 nil potent group of rank 2 with the infinite cyclic group, whose, whose lemma I just finished proving. That's residually blah, 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 blah. So how do I do that? Well, in one way, it's, it's fairly easy. It, it is fairly easy. So you take a, a W, non-trivial. What is W? W is, is an alternating product of Ns with As uh, of non-trivial. Um, it could, of course, end in N, and it could, of course, start in A. So, so I should show you the four different possibilities. But uh, anyhow, at least one of there's got to be at least something there that you know they can't all be trivial, obviously. Well, obviously. So considering n separately from a, forgetting about the free metabelian product. A nilpotent group, a free nilpotent group of rank 2, that's residually, uh, is fully residually a free nilpotent group of class 2 and 2 generators. And A, the, the abelian, free abelian group, is fully residually an infinite cyclic group. And so that means I can grab, you know, as so long as it's finite, I can grab as many words as I like from N, and I can map them trivially to, to, to what I want, 2 generator. Uh, class two free nilpotent group for the N and, a, and an infinite cyclic group for the A. Okay. Is, is, our, is our notion extending full, fully residually for infinite words? Maybe. Okay. Useful. I don't know about that because you could then take the whole group. <laughs> well, in, I mean, infinitely many words. Oh, oh, infinitely. not infinitely, infinitely many, because oh. yeah, but infinitely many, you could then say, like, let me take every single word. Yeah, exactly. You could do that. So then, so, so every group would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. okay. But it doesn't make sense to that. You omit some. What if you don't take all of them? Never mind. Yeah, that's going that. away. Yeah. An interesting thought. To, to but you still have an infinite. Though number of words remaining, even if you don't take all of them. You know. True. Yeah, so. yeah you, maybe you could talk about a proper subset. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Something a proper like subset. Of people, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't matter. All right, so the idea is we're going we're gonna to take some appropriate set of, of, of n, n words and, and map them to n hat. That's my, gonna be my rank 2 to a nil potent group. And another appropriate set of words separately from a and map them to a hat. The only question is, you know, what, what should I put in that set? Uh, I definitely want to start, so let me look at the n's. I definitely want to take n1, n2, up to nr, and I want to map them distinctly. And at first it seems like, you know, good enough. Then map those, the a words to a. But then what do you do once you get n hat and a hat? Now you form the free metabelian product. So you take the free product, you factor out by the second derived group. The words were distinct, but once you factor out by the second derived group, how do you know that stuff doesn't collapse and you and you start getting uh, elements of, of the set of the second derived group and suddenly your W is trivial? That's what you have to be careful about. That's what makes it at least you know not totally obvious. So, so the trick is to take not just n1, but every single segment of n1. At the beginning, at the end, in the middle, so you know, so N one is made up of A B C D E F G. You take A, you take B, you take D, you take A B, you take A B C, you take D E F. Take all those words. So your your finite set is still finite, but it's very large. 
And once you do that, and once you map all of those words distinctly and non-trivially, you see that, that uh, the only way W in, the, in its target could collapse to be a, a second derived uh, commutator of commutators, it would have had to have been right <coughs> at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, if it wasn't the beginning, then it's not non-trivial, it's trivial. So you, you, you pick the set large enough, and that does it for you. And that so, so this is really just n hat a quotient. Yeah. N hat is just a nilpotent group, pre nilpotent group of rank two. The quotient comes, did I name it? P hat. Oh. Mm. Okay. So you take the n hat, it's, it's just sitting very happily all by itself, and the a hat sitting very nicely, infinite cyclic group. You take their free product, and, and then you factor out there the second derived group. And that's the moment you say, whoops, did I lose W? Mm. And if you but take it could, be a, big it could be a quotient too, right? N hat. No. What do you mean? I mean, N hat is free no potent. Okay, okay. Class two. It's a quotient of a free group. Uh, okay. And that's it. So there's an algorithmic <laughs> way to pick the smarter <laughs> set. Sorry. Is there an algorithmic way of getting this large set so that it doesn't claim W? Well, I, I guess you can make an algorithm. You do take every single segment from every There's single There's a recipe. Every right. single segment from? Every single oh, word, word, N1, N2. Oh, I see. So you start with them. Yeah. Okay. You know, as I say, and then you break them down. N1 equals ABC. Uh -huh. Take A, take B, take C. Take right. AB, take BC. Take ABC. We right. already took ABC. I got you. Okay. Are there any questions? Have you, started, have you started thinking about, let's say, uh, two nilpotent groups? Those are two nilpotent groups. Oh, two with two? Nilpotent yes. with nilpotent? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, I know it's hard because when you do the wreath product, you're not going to be conjugating by a single. The wreath product would be tough. I think what might be. Easier step would be to go up to th yes, and keep the other part. I, and, and so, I don't know, but it's possible. It just means that the bookkeeping is like yeah. three times as hard, so you're going to have to have like ten subscripts mm -hmm. instead but, of. But here's what you can do: uh, two nilpotent groups are metabelian. Right, and so, three nilpotent groups. You have to start with a metabelian group. Uh, so you can impose that condition always, and, and that will simplify your life. I mean, maybe not a lot, but so you can take any, eventually take any nilpotent group, which is also and metabelian. factor out by the. Second and at least group. the commuter subgroup will be, will be commuted. Whoever, what do you say? Yeah, uh, for example, a five nilpotent group is yeah. not metabelian, sure. but you can make it so right. and work with only metabelian. Right. Yeah, things. so you could keep on going up. Three nilpotent is, of course, metabelian just to start. Mm -hmm. so I say, of course, but I always have to think, is it? Oh, yes, it is. It is. It but is. four nilpotent groups. No, no, no. I mean, I suspect that at some point somebody will say, probably as a byproduct of some other theorem, and by the way, you know, all free metabelian products of residually torsion free nilpotent uh, uh, metabelian groups is residually torsion free nilpotent. <laughs> right. you know, but it hasn't happened yet. But it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so, you know, so the choice is either should, you know, do you want to go for the gold or do you want to keep working your way up a little bit? Or, or you can do it for, for three nilpotent. And then, and then try the induction on the class. Try induction. You could try that. Hmm. Good idea. Right. And then, of course, you have to start playing with the second factor. Eventually. You've got to start bumping <laughs> not, up that not second right factor. Away. <laughs> <laughs> not right away. Hmm. Did you ever think about what this uh, way of handling the end part is having as a relationship with uh, with the maximal abelian subgroups. With picking because, the Yeah, set because words? you are looking at the fully re residual free whatever property. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you forget about near potency and metabelianness, then the requirement oh, so of just, fully residual freeness uh, is related to mm -hmm. maximal abelian subgroups mm -hmm. being my normal. Yeah. 
But how can you replace that malnormal condition by some other condition or elevate it with something else coupled so that it can give you a not so terribly combinatorial way of handling the next case? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. like CSA groups. Right, exactly. Yeah, because because, uh, because you are taking a cycle the CSA? to yeah. help you out. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So it is almost like yeah. you are no, looking no, 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 for that. how to solve That's equations and how condition. to eliminate solutions. Right. Yeah. 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 Your technique for this is purely combinatorial. It's, it's very combinatorial. Yes. There's playing. no like flashes of inspiration like, except to say, ah, so no. really <laughs> hard. What about the linearity aspects of this? Groups, the lin linearity aspects of, of, of a it. free metabolian product. Yes, I know the metabolian ones are linear, at least the finitely. Generally. Yeah, I think that they are. But free metabolian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about? But isn't, aren't they? Uh, oh, I, don't I don't know. Are I am a, you, never comfortable with the linear groups because they are matrices, and I always get misdirected. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because then you have to be very careful about yeah. where, the co where the entries are coming from yes, and yes. what kind of properties they themselves inherit from where they come. Yeah. yeah. So can you generate, um, I was, I was eight, you missed the definition of a free metabolian product. <laughs> yes, so can you generalize this to, you know, other notions like other varieties? Free metabolian product and just change the factors and just go through the proof? Uh, just proof or there's something special? Well, I, no, I definitely use the second derived group. I use some identities mm -hmm. specific to metabolian groups, but you could certainly try. So the, the notion of a free product in, in any variety, yes. it's, it's the same notion. Sure. And what if you change the tweet mm -hmm. button to more and then change the amalgamating? But then, then you uh, could yeah, well, well, different. You could change, you could go up to three null potent. Three. That's still not a billion. And that's, you know, what we were saying, yeah, that, that might be the next step to go. Once you go up to four null potent, you'd have to then make it. That's Gilbert Bumps like Gilbert Bumps like said that? Right, but then could you make the amount that's the way to go? Factor? Who said that? I'm sorry. Mm, we, we hear we Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You <laughs> just said that here. Yeah. No, I just thought maybe bomb slacks and she's left. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and at some point there should be some some global yes, that's true for all. But what, what do you mean by by changing the amalgamating part? For example, um, amalgamating subgroup. For example, my thesis was related, you know, was free uh, free products with, with, with amalgamation. And then when you change this uh, amalgamating subgroup, we can just make it happen and just make the group. I mean, so maybe instead of, instead of a free product, you could, so you could amalgamate right. some. But, but this, is not a, this is not a free product. This is not a, a, but maybe, no, I know, I know. But just like the idea that when you change the amalgamating subgroup, you could change the property. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you, you could you can, you can make, make a non-trivial amalgamating this. subgroup. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, we're, we're saying, well, and, and for Fornil potent doesn't work, but the truth of the matter is, Fornil potent is not um, metabolian. Well, true, Fornil potent is not metabolian. In Sorry, erase that. What I wanted to say was, every group or, or class of groups that we're thinking about, here's where we could increase to. Uh, we could also increase to groups that are only residually nil potent. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to be nil potent to start with. Or you can also. So you have to be in a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're using this uh, derived group, mm -hmm. if you consider, I mean, no one really used free polycyclic group, but you could still use the. I mean, they're, they're still solvable. So you could get the. So maybe you could, you, you could go to a free solvable. You, to, you have more options to do that. Okay. You're right, then you could go higher than you have. I don't know how they use it in literature, but just a question. See, I suspect that the, the, using the combinatorial aspect, it would just get 
messier and messier and messier until you, you, know, you go mad. So you need to change the technique. So I think that at, pretty soon, very soon, the technique is going to have to be some global. Mm -hmm. I mean, induction could be one. <laughs> induction might be one way to go. Or you need some big machine. <laughs> saying before though when you conjugate the commentators and they jack off one at a time yeah. this reminds me of climbing up a, a series of the policy yeah. yeah that's why that's why uh -huh. I asked because they were leaving to probably bring in algebra uh, <laughs> right. there's no point